Welcome to the P Pro Podcast, where we're going to discuss how P and sport can change lives. Today we've got an exciting lineup. We've got a special guest. We've got the legend Sue Wilkinson, the chair and the CEO of AFPI. Uh, welcome today, Sue. How's things? Hello, Ryan. Thank you for inviting me. I'm good. Really busy, but good. So we can't complain and the sun is out. Absolutely. So thank you for coming on board. Today we're going to discuss the journey. We're going to take you right back to the start. We want to know how P and sport impacted your life. So where did it all begin, Sue? Well, oh, that's a long way back there, Ryan. <laughs> I, uh, I was just very fortunate. Uh, father was uh, a really good footballer. I was on the, on the books at West Bromwich Albion. My mom was a really good hockey player and an ice skater. And my auntie swam from, for the army. So as far back as I can remember, I think because my dad had two girls as well, we played an awful lot of football, very stereotypical in those days, but he had us active. Every weekend we went to relatives in Western Supermare and we were on the beach come rain or snow, running, walking, swimming. So it's always been there for me. So, I, you know, I, I just don't remember life without being physically active. Uh, I went to a great primary school in the 60s, very much. Did a lot of skittleball, very much about movement, BBC movement and mime and all of that. So I had great teachers who were really interested in physical education as it was. And then I didn't grow particularly uh, tall and uh, I really wanted to do gymnastics. Olga Corbett was sort of uh, my icon there and had quite a successful time of gym. And when I went to secondary school, again, massive PE department who sort of supported that journey. You know, even my PE teacher, if mom and dad were working, would drive me to competitions and everything. So I got heavily into that. And then it was my PE teacher. I had two of them, which was quite funny. Uh, Mrs. Firkin and Miss Lightfoot was my gymnastics and dance teacher. And they were both absolutely brilliant. And they, I, they know I wanted to study law. And um, they said, have you ever thought about teaching PE? And it was really funny because I just changed when I was 17, changed. I said, right, yeah, I'd really like to do that. So um, I'd finished competing by then. I was doing an awful lot of coaching. And so I went to Bedford College of Higher Education because it had quite a prolific uh, gymnastic uh, reputation there, as well as trampoline, as well as swimming, all the things I absolutely loved. Uh, and of course, hockey. There I met a lecturer called Chris Heath, who introduced me to lacrosse, which was a real eye opener. Um, and so I've always been surrounded by P and sport. It's and always just, been part of the life. Yeah, just on that, so let's just go back a bit further. So you talk about the gymnast. What what got you hooked? Was it something you've seen on telly or with your parents? Or was it, you talk about that, the role model there. Who was it? It was everything. Uh, Olga Corbett, as I said, you know, yes, I watched that. We was always on, tele down. on television, yes, right. on, on the television. School holidays, watching, you know, all sorts of sport. And, you know, mum and dad took me to gymnastics because it was something that was great for me because of my height. And in those days, they sort of measured I really was interested in ballet, but they did say I might be too tall. Well, got that one wrong, didn't they, at five foot one? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, the gymnastics. And it was something I was really good at. Uh, and, you know, when, when you excel at something, you become more confident. And I really did in, enjoy that part of it the competition as, as well as the success. I mean, it started early in primary school with the, the old bag of awards, you know. I mean, everybody loves a badge, don't you, and a sticker. Um, yeah. You know, I, did, I wasn't particularly successful at the athletics, but you still did it because, you know, my, my teacher and my coach used to say, you've got to be cardiovascularly fit. You've got to build those leg muscles so you can perform on the floor. Uh, and so you did that in the cross country because I, I wasn't a fan of cross country. But the bit, yeah, I mean, not too. I think the big, the big thing we said that your parents support. We talk about oh. we different people on the podcast and how, how, how beneficial was that having your parents support? Oh, absolutely. And my aunt. I mean, she. Uh, she I went to see her last night. Actually, she's ninety-two, oh. and uh, she swam for for the army. And and you know, we were in the pool for as far back as I remember. And she was one who took us swimming every weekend as well as as at school because sc swimming was really front and centre when I was at school you did not leave primary school without that bronze medallion you know, you know making the float out your pyjamas and and the brick Picking so the, the combination brick. yeah school and family and extended family is what really matters so a lot of positive influences early on so you went to primary got into there then into secondary and then where did it go from there you start thinking about the teaching more then 
yeah I, I kept up my coaching role I was very lucky Jenny Bott um was my lecturer at university and she was um very involved in art, uh, rhythmic gymnastics as well so I learned a different aspect of it uh and then obviously when I came out I thought I've got to carry this on so I continued to coach for some while afterwards uh and then in 1984 I had quite a serious car accident which sort of stopped me coaching simply because um, I, w I didn't feel safe enough to support gym gymnasts. And so I went into other aspects of coaching, you know, a hockey, trampolining and that sort of stuff. I kept it through and, you know, really had it at the central, uh, at the centre of the curriculum wherever I went, as well as getting those clubs for children to come in as well. And um, I ended up in a school in quite a deprived area. Um, so we were at one of the first community schools in England and we were open from seven in the morning till 10 at night 358 days of the year wow. and because they didn't have the funding to have community staff it was run by the PE staff uh, and I don't think I worked Friday afternoon for about six years our, our department had Friday afternoons off um, so we could run all the clubs and everything afterwards and what we found there is a lot of the parents didn't want to come into the schools so um the, the head of department at the state, he's so visionary. He said, let's have a community parent and children's club. And we set up a, a badminton community club ladder expecting about eight to 10 parents. And we couldn't believe when, when the school closed and we opened the community doors at Hops Five, there was almost 50 parents and their children. Wow. And it, it became a standard thing. And from there we had parent and children aerobic classes, we started to have uh, teams and clubs. And again, it's something that's carried on it in, into the community clubs I've been involved with as well, that it's really important to engage parents so yeah. they know the value of peeing in sport. Uh, and that's been quite a game changer for me because I grew up knowing parents of great influence. You assume everybody else has that same opportunity and that parents and carers are there and they love PE, which, which isn't the case. Yeah, we know, I know some, you know, from my experience playing with, you know, players that have come from exactly opposite what, probably what you've had there, where they've had, you know, pair, I know one lad now that's playing in England that's, you know, lost his dad early on in his, you know, career. Never, you know, his mum was, uh, uh, without saying too much about the person, yet really, really had a trouble with Brand, but, you know, he's turned it around, he's playing for England, you see. So you, you just see so many variables, don't you? But it's interesting what you're saying there about your coaching. You started out as a coach. And then you start, right, OK, I'm going to have a look at teaching. Is that how it went then? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was a coach long before I was a teacher. Uh, and it was really good because uh, becoming a teacher made me a better coach. But being a coach also helped my knowledge in the technical aspect. So yeah. the, the two were fantastic in, in helping me sort of work out what it is I needed to teach the children, how the different ways of doing it, because not everybody loves your subject. And then you find out why. And, you know, that was a real game changer because when I was coaching, people were there because they wanted to be. Yes. When you're in school teaching PE, they're there <laughs> because they have to be. Yeah. So absolutely. you have to make it the most exciting subject on the curriculum. And I think the game changer for me was we, we selected children who were not particularly engaged with school. And we took them on a lot of school trips, which the school paid for. Uh, we took them on a, you know, canal trip for a week because they'd never been away. And uh, you took them on other activities. You took them away to the seaside. And then all of a sudden they came back and PE became their favourite subject. And we actually did some research to say, is it the way they're taught? Is it the subject? Is it the teacher? And it's all of those things together. And I think because PE can be less formal and you're in a more social setting, it can build different types of relationships. Yeah. Uh, and particularly uh, I had a very visionary head at, at the last school and used to have to sit and watch each other's lessons and I'd see children behave very differently in other subjects than they did in our and vice versa so it was sort of he got us to look at that why are they behaving and talk to the children the pupil voice was critical why is it you behave like this in this lesson and this in a different lesson you are the same person and when we got underneath that behavior in the school changed exponentially for the better Comes so big thing which you know, comes down to people, people. But I suppose when you look at the three things there, the environment, different things, the person's got to drive it, and they want them to change as well. So where did it go from from there? Then into you think, right, I'm going to go teaching. Where did it go from there? Yeah, well, it's just always been part part of my life, really. And we got involved, you know, when I sort of got married and had children, we got involved 
they've sort of grown up with sort of all different types of activities. My husband was quite sort of biased towards the oval ball and I used to put round and oval and tiny <laughs> tennis ball. Wow. And what, what they did was they were good at everything, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then my youngest son, as he got older, he had to choose. Uh, and he went down the cricket route and, and you know, my eldest son went down the, the rugby union and now he's tag rugby. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it, it's always been central to our lives too. Um, but I've, I've always known how important PE is, but it really shocked me when I had my accident in uh, 1990, uh, sorry, 2016. I just fell crossing the road and cut a very long story short, basically I broke my neck and ended up paralyzed down the right side of, of my body. And um, again, thanks to the NHS, uh, I went to various hospitals and ended up in Oswald Street Spinal Unit. Uh, that was in the October and flat on my back for a long time, couldn't move, couldn't do anything. And um, slowly they sort of got me to sort of sit up and stand up, and but I, I couldn't walk and I was still sort of quite badly paralyzed. And then this wonderful surgeon decided to operate. The, the odds weren't great. It was, I could end up completely paralyzed from the neck down I could remain the same or there could be some improvement and um, you know as a family we discussed it and thought right I'll take I'll take the operation and it was quite interesting because I then came into rehabilitation and I was strapped almost to a lectern and we did lots of exercises and one of the physios said to me you're extremely strong for someone who's been in it and obviously my, my age I wish I was 35 but I'm not and then I, we start to play sort of a ball with balloons first, then a ball. And, you know, there was team, the Invictus team used that facility, all sorts of people. And I got paired with, with this, this guy, and, you know, we're friends to this day. And I threw the ball at him and knocked him off his lectern. And I was absolutely <laughs> horrified. He it, it just said, I wasn't expecting that. And the physio sort of came and had a look and said, you know, you've got an extremely strong core. And somewhere underneath, you know, the, the, the sort of belly, um, they sort of had a look at this, this, this core aspect and started to give me more and more and weight training and everything. And uh, you know, six months later, three of us walked out, albeit not the most creatively and aesthetically walking out of there, but we walked out of that unit. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is the surgeons, all three of us were involved in some way at sport at different levels. One was a runner. This colleague had, had played a lot of football and there was myself and they do believe that core that was the hidden and the muscle memory was really helpful in, in, in helping me to get back wow. um I, I you know there's a great youtube video we use called why adults fail and it shows that motor skill about being able to throw a ball cast a fishing net being able to shop open the door and throw keys and people will dodge and we all know someone like that and it's really because they've not had a lot of physical education. And if I try to say to a five, seven, 13, 16 year old, if you don't do PE and you have an accident or you fall over, it, it, it could have a detrimental effect. And it's really hard because I knew how important PE was, but I didn't realize it would get me walking again. Wow. You know, and, and that it's, there's still a lot of research about it because it builds that core. And obviously Ryan, it, it changed my life from yeah. being flat on my back just being able to speak to being sort of you know fully functional yeah. I get very tired sometimes but that's a result of the spinal injury and I do have some uh, sometimes problems gripping but other than that I, you know I'm back at work full time that's amazing now you talk about interest in there because you talk about the core and thing of the gymnastic but obviously that's the physical side what about you talk about your injury there and if you talk about the if we talk about that mental thing of, of, of what you learn playing sport, do you think you had things in there, your resilience and things that you get to learn? Did that help with your recovery as well, do you think? Yeah, and it, it was really painful. I think I've only spoke about it once before this um, because uh, I, what happened was, you know, I'd be lying there and I thought, you know, actually, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. And Martin, you know, the, the, the volleyball player who unfortunately was injured in, in the bombing, she sent me up her book and she was absolutely brilliant. And she was right. She said, there will be darkest moments. And, you know, I was a four hour round trip from relatives. And, you know, you'd be lying there and you just think, I just don't want to do this. And the staff were absolutely brilliant talking and you, you can do this. And then one day we you have to go to lectures when you moved out of the war, the high dependency into rehabilitation. And this guy said to us, 
your injury, a lot of it is up here. And his friends of mine shout to them about, you're not the one sat in the wheelchair. And, you know, we were quite a rebellious class at times. <laughs> and I thought, you know what is right about this? I can give up. And I thought, have I ever given up? And I thought, no, I haven't actually. And I think all of a sudden that that was it. And I was in an electric wheelchair. So I went down to the male ward and I, I said to my colleague, my friend as he is now, we can do this. And, and he, he was furious. I, I can't repeat what he said. There were so many expletives about, you know, it's not in my head, it's in my spine. And we decided we were going to stand up and have a go. And there was a very elderly gentleman there. He, he was in his late 80s. He was from Wales. He'd fallen in a barn. And, and he was begging us on, come on, you can do this. And then all of a sudden, both of us became so, uh, so determined. Now, that wasn't just born out of that accident. I think that had been there all the time. You get used to success. You get used to failure. And what do you do? You get up and you have another go. But also what I learned is, you know, you never look down on anyone unless it's to help them up because that's what they did in hospital. All those physios, nurses, patients never said, you can't do this. Uh, and, and one of the funniest things I, I, I had was when I came out of hospital and I, I was going to, to Buckingham Palace, I do like my clothes. And I said to, to the uh, physio, these are the shoes I'm going in. And the look on her face was, but she never said no. <laughs> She said, how long have I got to get you to walk in those shoes? And I said, six weeks. And she said, right, impossible we can do. Miracles may take us a little longer. I fell over, I rolled over. I, it was just hysterical. But the sheer determination, and she said, I have never met anybody with such determination and resilience as you. You will never give up. And I said, well, you just don't, do you? You know, and you think about your kids and your partner and your friends and all those colleagues that supported you. And I think, yeah, that was born out of pain. But because my parents were like that. My mom had polio, said she'd never walk again, but she did. You know, she's a successful businesswoman. You know, I, I've, I've seen I've seen my dad actually, he was a property developer, fall off a roof and, and get up and, and carry on. I'm not saying that's a good thing because he did actually break his wrist, but it's that sheer determination that you can do this. And, and I'm sure it's born out of pain that's amazing you know wow wow yeah that's a take my house like, wow that, that was 2016 and now we're 2020 we've been through covid and you know you've been up to sale last week to see jason down there and the, and the p that's going on so i know what's the thing on the hong kong we see about did you travel did you ever go abroad and uh we do some teaching over there then yeah yeah i was i was really lucky it was uh when i was a, a p advisor in hereford and worcester we worked a lot with with uh, other advisors across uh, the, you know, the West Midlands. And um, we, we worked with Wolverhampton University and they had the contract to train uh, teachers in Hong Kong because they couldn't get a promotion in those days without a British or an American degree. So we, we used to go over there for you know, two months at a time and then they'd come back over here uh, to teach. And it was a real eye opener because if you wanna see resilience and determination, oh Lord. Uh, a, a colleague of mine, Jez Woodhouse, um, he was an advisor over in Dudley Local Authority and we went out, he was doing the outdoor and adventurous and I was doing the gymnastics and the dance. And we set up this course at the university to get the students all sorts of team building activities. And they came in and this group of teachers was a broad spectrum of age and experience. And we set up all these things. And one of them was, it was, um, they had a plank. Uh, there was a huge set of hoops. And we told them there was oil, fire, everything around them. They've got to get the whole team to safety. And it usually takes people about 10, 15 minutes to plan it. They try things out. They don't work and so on. And this guy lined everybody up. And he, he just said on the count of three. And every single one of them from a standing position dived through the hoop and out the other side. And we just stood there because we'd never seen that. <laughs> and I said, how did you get them to do that? And he said, it, it was mine find over matter and focus and that was a that's a big part of my life I do a lot of meditation that way I do it every night you know because that especially the pain sometimes yeah. um it, it really does help you know you can do this it's a pain it'll go away you know you can manage this and particularly in covid the emotional resilience you've had to develop I mean we've been 15 months out of our office and you know one of the challenges for me has been IT 
I, you know, they, I have a fantastic team behind me, but I'm normally in the office with them. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm out on my, own, on my own, you know, and I'm on mute and I can't get the volume to work or I can't get the camera to work, you know, or I haven't shut down teams and I'm trying to get onto another system. And that resilience makes you really sort of uh, stronger. If you've got two minutes to go and you're about to record it and you have to think, right, breathe, focus. What would I do if I was walking out on a match and my boot had just broken or, you yeah. know, I just got a twinge. What would, what would I do? And it, it's all of that emotional and character building. Yeah. And you yeah. learn that we talk about everything in terms of purpose in life as we develop from, you know, where we are and start to where we are now on that journey and try to enjoy the journey, the sun and the rain. We talk about your influence there from Hong Kong over there to how did that affect, impact your teaching when you came back over here? Did that, did it change it anything? Or? It reinforced that actually the system we have in the UK, you know, we always moan, don't we? Because we always want better. Yeah. But the rote learning for me, is, is was something I wasn't comfortable with. Um, and it, it, it was just, there, there were things we learned were often because space is a, is a premium. Some of the schools, their playgrounds are on a roof. Now health and safety ha- over here would have a, a great big defenses to protect them. The children's awareness of health and safety was absolutely incredible because you know it was just the way they were disciplined. So there was things about giving pupil voice, you know, you must understand and, it was something our health and safety team, all of the authors have always said, teach safety, teach safely. Now you can only do that if the children understand that. Yeah. And so that was something I brought back long before I was in this role, that actually we've got to talk to children more. Yeah. We've got to have a say. And that doesn't mean you always, if they want, they always get. It's just sometimes maybe I hadn't always explained properly why we were doing something. And this is my issue now, Ryan, that, Children need to be, arti- to be able to articulate why PE is so good. And some of our team have been back out on the road this week doing quality mark for schools. And yesterday, Eileen Marchant was down in, in the Dales and she said she's interviewed these children and how articulate, how much they could say PE makes the difference and I'm a better character. And actually, because I'm calmer, I'm studying better. Yeah, it's an, and how much they've missed PE while they've been off at home because there's been limitations in what they yeah, can absolutely, do. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, the physical activity and what teachers have done, we've got to celebrate is, you know, yeah. I feel strongly about this, the word catch up. Let's celebrate what every teacher, every parent, every carer, and every pupil has done and learned. They've learned other things, but they've learned different things. Yeah, we 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 can empathise massively. We took you know because we're working with still with twelve thousand children a week in yeah. over across the UK, and uh, the key workers and the vulnerable children and some of the stuff that's been going on schools is they've just been twenty four seven on the teachers. So hats off to them and the heads, and they're dealing with you know the, the COVID and not just that the wipes and the sanitising and all the stuff there, and, but obviously all the stuff that we're seeing on the back of that with the emotional stuff that's going on behind the scenes and the and there's stuff that needs support there as well. So it's uh so where do you think now we are as a as a as a whole 2021 talking about the sports premium potentially going again? Uh do we know what's happening with that? Is that still down the pile with government and the task force and things? Yeah, I, I you know, I think it's really important that there's a, a letter gone out today, an open letter to, to the Secretary of State. Um, you know, I think everybody realizes the country has invested an awful lot of money and rightly so. In, in the NHS to get everybody well and better. Um, but in order to recover, it is important that that PE and sport premium funding continues. I think my message to school is we, we've got to be hopeful. Um, there is a delay, not because anybody wants a delay. I think they're trying to ensure the, there's funding available and they've got to get everybody working together to make sure that everything is in place right across all sectors, whether it's education, the NHS. I think, you know, if there's an announcement, we can have it for another year. We've got to be absolutely upfront and prioritise and make sure peace, sport and physical activity is front and centre of every school. And I think my most important message would be plan for sustainability. Which is upskill the teachers. Oh, spot on, Ryan, because, (laughs) you know, uh, teaching, we are getting a lot of turnover at the moment, obviously. So that, you know, it's not displacing anybody or, you know, saying people 
what it won't be about because there will always be an opportunity to upskill teachers but teachers are the workforce they are sustainable they are there all the time and so if we continue to upskill them and then we have good PE we will then have a good enrichment program and people will want to do sport activities and clubs after school and then hopefully that will lead to more community involvement and they'll want to go swimming they'll want to go to, to Pilates they will want to go to boxer size clubs or you know, sports clubs like rugby, cricket, football, hockey, they will want to do all of those things. So it, it's a journey almost, you know, it's PE, that's good, we'll get them going to clubs. If the clubs are good, we'll get them into the community. So it's a seamless journey. So yeah, I, we don't know anything as yet. Hopefully we will know something soon. Um, and when, if and when we get that money, we've got to make sure it's spent wisely. I think, I don't know if you've seen this as well with the COVID, that the thing we've seen definitely now, you know, parents, especially when you want to get engaged to kids, they're putting them everywhere, right, which is great. We're seeing on some of the stuff that's happening. Uh, it's like an emotional thing, right? I need to get them out. We know there's still a bit of a dip with the 12s, 13s, the teenagers, where it's a bit, you know, the numbers are still not getting there. Some areas they are, we'll see. Uh, yeah. Have you seen that as well, what you're seeing from the numbers you're seeing as well? Yeah, I think, you know, the Active Lives Survey did show that teenage girls are probably doing more activity, but it's different. You know, they, 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 they might be doing different things. We worked on a project with Sport England, uh, Studio U, and it just looked at different curriculum activities for girls. And they were so engaged, it was incredible. So I think what we've got to see is a, a broader and balanced curriculum. You know, Ofsted talked about ambition. You know, the national curriculum is the bare minimum. You know, schools can do whatever they want. Uh, at the moment, it's got to be in relation to government guidance and local authority guidance, but they've been so creative. Some of the activities out there, like for instance, as you say, that you know, the tag rugby's really taken off. Um, doing a lot more dance, doing a lot more um, sort of gym, different types of gymnastics. Swimming for me is a big issue. 150,000 primary children left school in 2019, unable to reach the minimum. And we've got a staycation, safe self rescue, absolute life skill. And you know, heads and parents want their children emotionally well. Absolutely. Yeah. They want them active. Great. Just, but it's got to stay yeah. carrying on. Just on that swim, it's really interesting. I'm a massive advocate of what you're saying there. I find when I speak to quite a lot of heads, is their thing with the, the PE or the, the swimming is, which this is without naming names, is like, right, okay, I want to send them there, but the cost it takes to get them there, they get 20 minutes, they have a dip in, they get out. Is there ways around that? Or do you think that's how it's always going to be? No, I, I think that's always been a barrier. You know, we, we know that. Yeah. Um, I know there's big discussions about extending the school day. I think some schools have been really creative. The, you know, I went to visit a school in London that had a pop-up pop -up pool. Amazing the way the head had set it up. It was children waiting, reading, doing their literacy. And then the, they went to the pool. Those went and got changed. It, it was just amazing. We've, we filmed at a school in Wakefield. You've been there at Sandal yeah. Castle. They've got their own pool, you know, state school. So it is slightly easier for them. It's about sharing facilities, looking at pop-up schools, having a suspended timetable. So for that week, the children swim and then working with parents to ensure they, there is a way of trying to support that. I think we've got to have some kind of investment and commitment. So swimming is a lot more affordable outside of school. Yeah. For, for those who find it quite a challenge financially um, and then I think we've got to look at how that timetable is, is sort of set up again one of our quality mark schools they swim in every year from year one to year six now how are they managing it so it's really important to use case studies where schools have found solutions you know they're the best people to do that and the Department for Education funded a project with nine teaching schools alliances from, from across the country for those schools to look at swimming and there was the Department of Education, um, RLSS and Swim England and ourselves. And there's some fantastic resources because what we had to do was think differently with staycation. Can you teach safe self-rescue on land? And that was something I was talking to Sale about. You know, they've got that massive room. So it's COVID safe. If we could get children there, and then, as you say, because it takes time on the timetable, let's get them doing other activities. Could that be there? A lot of PE is done there on that particular day of the week. Now, we don't want safe self-rescue to be always land-based, but it is a way of starting to raise children's awareness that actually 
if you do fall in the water, these are the things you could do. Because even when you do it in a swimming pool, falling in cold water is quite different. And there's some fantastic resources out there from the Canal Trust as well, RLSS, Swim England. You know, schools could show those what you know why they're in school. But I think we've just got to be creative with the timetable. Okay. So if there's one last one last message you'd like to say to head teachers and things at the moment regarding, you know, P and sport in schools, what what would it be? It's to keep that broad and balanced curriculum that's ambitious, that is bespoke for your children, your resources and your workforce to ensure your teachers are really upskilled and then use other partners and external agencies to help with the, that upskilling and the enrichment programme. And it's to keep PE front and central because the impact on the cognitive development and academic results, you know, it, it, it's there, it's well documented, it's researched by people other than us. Eminent researchers have shown the difference it, it can make. And I just say, keep it front and central. Don't have a COVID curriculum, have a broad and balanced one. Brilliant. Thank you for today, So That's, yeah, that's been amazing. I could have been listening to you six hours there. That's really good. Thank but you that, for having me on. No, brilliant. Thank you.